So we're continuing this team of business in the SDGs, and we're delighted to have Gail uh, Schuler, who's the VP and Chief Sustainability Officer of 3M. It's a pleasure to join you today. Thank you. So, Gail, thank you for being with us. Uh, and we're really talking about, with you, uh, one of the iconic companies of the world uh, and one of the great problems, which is uh, the uh, chemical industry, petrochemicals, uh, uh, pollution, uh, uh, circular economy, and so forth, and you're right at the center of it. You're an expert on this, on uh, material science, and on sustainability. So could you introduce what 3M is thinking about, what the problems are, the legacy issues, and where you're heading? Yeah, so, well, 3M is a company that's been around since 1902. Um, we were founded in northern Minnesota by um, five industrious businessmen that um, thought that they were going to establish a mining operation. So it, was, it used to be Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing. Okay. And um, the, the thought was they were going to mine that highly valuable hard mineral called corundum. And, and as science evolves, they found out that what the land they bought really didn't have corundum at all. It had a much softer, virtually non-economically viable material called anorthosite. And so their, their plans of creating sandpaper with that really didn't pan out. But what they did was they innovated through this, and they found that, the, um, that they invented a wet or dry sandpaper, because now instead of just using the mineral as the hard piece, they created a coating on it that would create a new sandpaper. So 3M started as a failure um, of not having what they thought they had and innovated to make something brand new. And so that's how sandpaper started. That led to... Really? That, that's how wet or dry sandpaper. So if you're yeah. used to using sandpaper and it's okay to get it wet, that's that, that, came, that came from 3M. Yeah. And then, you know, sometime later, um, we were selling sandpaper. A gentleman named Dick Drew was serving our customers and went into the auto industry as the auto industry was just starting and help, was helping them with abrasive solutions, but quickly realized that wasn't the real challenge that they were facing in that space. And... Um, what the challenge was in the 1920s was creating cars that had two different paint colors on them. But if you're going to put two paint colors on a car, how do you separate one from another? And so he went into the labs and figured out that if we removed the mineral, we would take the backing from our wet or dry sandpaper and have just the right adhesive, suddenly you could create a masking tape oh my God. that would allow for the masking of materials and have paint of one color next to paint of another color. These things didn't exist before that time, and we could go down through many things that have been innovations through the years, whether it's respirators to help um, people breathe clean air when they're working in challenging environments, which then turn into filtrate filters in people's homes, or whether it's uh, traffic signage that helps save millions and millions of lives all around the world by making signs visible at daylight and at nighttime under wet or dry conditions. And so we've continued, we're a very science-based company that's at our core, and we continue to reinvent things as, as we evolve and as, as our um, environment is in place. We have, um, Moving forward now in time, in 1975, we set forward a program that's called Pollution Prevention Pays. It was um, revolutionary at its time to think that pulling things out of a product and reducing pollution would really reduce not only the waste that's coming, whether it's from material waste or, or water waste, soil waste, um, air pollution, but moving that out would also um, actually save money. And so over time, we have saved over $2 billion just in first year savings alone from that products, and 2 million metric tons of waste have been pulled out just on, based on first year savings. Um, in 1990, we sent forward our first um, sustainability goals. 
because we recognized that there were important things that we could do with our own footprint. And so those goals at that time were really about our own footprint and what could we do to make sure that we were producing those products that help people save lives, whether it was through traffic safety or, or safety and breathing for workers or healthcare applications. Um, but we, we could also do better with our own footprint. And so we focused there. And so over time, we've advanced those sustainable goals that we've had and continue to identify ways that we can um, further advance. So in um, 2015, we brought forward our current um, sustainability goals based on five global challenges. And there, um, there's 14 of those. We've been, they're, they're set to mature in 2025. And we're making good progress overall, some stronger than others. Um, and that, well, and then just this past year, we brought forward um, a new framework for us around sustainability. We have our new CEO who's been in the role a bit over a year, Mike Roman, is leading us. And he brought forward in his first investor meeting commitments for us to, to recognize the ability that we have to really address lives and impact around the world. And we identified three areas to help with an ambition to improve every life and use our science to do that. So it was about science for circular, to help advance a circular economy. And then uh, it was about science for climate, which we're all here in New York and really focused on efforts on how do we help adapt and mitigate climate challenges. And then it was about science for community, bringing those things forward to help in the healthcare space and help in the, um, help in various safety areas and, and ways that we help people all around the world. So we tend not to think of ourselves actually as a chemical company, but more of a diversified um, group. We do have chemical operations. We have no petroleum operations. Yep. But um, we exist in um, 70 countries around the world. We employ 90,000 employees, all serving a common vision around bringing together science and the latest in technologies that we can bring to bear collectively, collaborating with others to help improve lives. Could you uh, give us a picture you're leading the sustainability effort in the company. Uh, how you view the regulatory and competitive environment, because 3M's trying to uh, do things right. There are a lot of companies that don't do things right that are directly competing with you, or maybe a level playing field would be helpful for you in terms of a common global set of standards and so on. So how does that play out? Uh, tell us as, uh, you know, those of us in uh, the policy community, what should we hear from you about how to make this work and how to make sure that you're doing the right thing, but also that the best companies are able to get the advantage for doing the right thing? Yeah, Jeffrey, I really appreciate that comment because regulations are so important and having the right regulations is really important because um, the, it, it, it helps the companies who are doing the right things and really advancing and challenging themselves um, to really get full credit, if you will, and then it can mitigate risks in other places. We've been quite um, active in areas where we're relevant. We believe in science-based regulations. Um, too often, there can be knee-jerk um, reactions, and I, I'm as guilty as anyone is wanting to jump on board with some things that just seem like the right idea, but then when you really learn all the science behind it, you start to recognize <laughs> that, oh wait, we just made it impossible to, to do certain things that we do want to do. So, you know, we've been really involved in helping with traffic safety, for example, helping with worker safety and, mm -hmm. and healthcare areas. But, you know, the, the concern is that sometimes there's unintended consequences if we go through regulations um, without being fully informed. So for regulators and people who are working in regulatory policy, my, my consult would be to, um, to partner to, to partner with those who are working hard in the space and really be informed about what can be done and, and what can't. And, what, and the other thing that I, I love to do when there's you know, potential regulations at stake, and gosh, it seems like there are in every, yeah. in every place where we're working these days, is to partner with different groups. 
So um, it's really important um, to make sure that we have the, the groups that understand what's happening in the space from a manufacturing side, as well as a regulation side, as well as a civil society side. You know, you had a great discussion just now with Pat Brown, yeah. and I love, there's so many fabulous implications on um, going with plant-based diets, but we need to pay attention to some of the unintended consequences with that as well. And um, when we're looking at having nine, possibly 10 billion people looking at living on the planet, we need to be able to extrapolate in big ways with any things that we're doing. And we also need to recognize the, the trends that are behind us and that one of the things that I look at from the sustainability area is to help make the things that are the right things to do truly aspirational for people. And I just, that's something I love about Impossible Foods. I think Tesla's gone a long way with electric vehicles. I think there's, a lot of things happening right now with renewable energy where they're the right things to do and so many people at first feel challenged by oh that's change and maybe I'm concerned about it because of change um, but when you see how it can happen and how it really evolves into spaces that people want to be a part of that's a really exciting thing. So many times uh, companies have uh when a danger is found uh, have denied it until you know, they feel there's some answer or things have dragged on for a long time. Big crisis, uh, and then, you know, finally maybe a solution is coming. Yesterday, uh, I was part of a discussion uh, about uh, the ozone issue and how that was solved. And that was a case where DuPont uh, uh, was uh, making the chlorofluorocarbons and when the ozone depleting effects were discovered, they denied it, denied it, denied it, and then re-engineered and uh, finally came up with a, an alternative, uh, hydrofluorocarbons, and then acknowledged it, and then made a quite a dramatic change. But given corporate culture, and you're part of a giant, iconic company, um, how can we make that process work better so that it is, uh, the companies are not so defensive uh, at the beginning, uh, also, that there's a systematic process, not a lobbying process, but just a systematic process of assessment. And I think a lot of it also is how to keep, again, a, a level playing field that the good companies aren't getting punished by the bad companies. I just wonder if you, you must live this uh, day by day, year by year. What, what, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, so um, we, we do always, <laughs> We're, we're, we're committed to working hard on our science. We have approximately 10,000 scientists around the world working on a variety of things from healthcare applications to post-it notes to um, uh, things that help make electric vehicles possible. Um, and we, we take our responsibilities around things really seriously. So if there's a new scientific um, study or breakthrough that we're making, we make sure that we're, we're studying that well. Um, as, as you're probably aware, we had um, some chemistries that we had out in the 1970s that they were actually brought forward by the, the U.S. Navy um, under a commission wanting to find solutions to help people in confined spaces like submarines um, and um, to help put out fires in controlled spaces. And, and we helped you know, work with the Department of Defense to create chemistries that weren't able to, that were able to do those fire things in ways, fire retardants that helped um, save thousands and thousands, if not millions of lives over time. Um, but we did recognize with that particular chemistry as one example of something that we've studied with hundreds and hundreds of papers um, in, the, in the public literature that um, it had a persistent and bioaccumulative effect and that we were finding it in places we didn't expect. So we actually went ahead and um, chose to remove that from the market at the time. And we chose to notify um, any peer companies who were producing in that space. We actually brought forward to the EPA um, that that was going on on and, and, yeah. and worked with them in a number of different ways. You know, so, and, and then when we removed our product from the market, um, we've seen a steady decline of that persistent material that we saw. It's, it's steadily declined and um, 
we've learned a lot more about it since then. We continue to study that along with other products that you know, we bring forward. As we work on our, um, our three pillars around sustainability, you know, we're constantly innovating. In fact, um, after we launched our strategic framework around sustainability with those three pillars, we came out at COP24 last year and announced that every new product that we launch, every new product that we commercialize starting in 2019 in this year must have a sustainability value commitment. And so we work on what are the right ways to, to help our scientists all around the world to make sure that every new product we're launching has an advance versus its predecessor. And so, you know, some examples of that um, in, the, in the circular economy space. So some of you may have um, familiarity with those classic Scotch-Brite sponges, you know, the, the yellow sponge with the green scouring surface. Um, those, as of this year, those scouring fibers, the, 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 the sponges made from plant-based sources and has been for a long time, and the fibers are now from 100% recycled plastics. So right. things coming out of your former water bottles or, or things you know, could be from the ocean or wherever. Um, so those are 100% recycled plastics. We're announcing um, uh, this fall, we are introducing Thinsulate made with 100% recycled plastics. So lots of new things coming. Um, we just hosted uh, one of our partners who's bringing in you know, the down-free outerwear and they're coming out with 100% recycled or 100% recycled material um, parkas this year. And they'll be down comforter, uh, down free comforters based with 100% recycled insulate and things like that. In the climate space, you know, we've launched products like, um, um, well, things that help electric vehicles last longer, help cell phone Mainly batteries battery last longer. Or, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, and lightweighting the vehicles themselves, you know, uh -huh. with the materials. We also have. And can I ask you just about yeah. that? Uh, you're a major part part of that supply chain. Do you think the American automobile companies are ready for a major transition to electric vehicles? That this is that our industry is really gearing up for the reality of that, or is it still? Are you feeling a big surge, or we're testing? We'll see. Where do yeah, we stand well, on that I will right tell now? You that every automotive company I'm aware of yeah. is working on electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. Now there's different trade-offs, they have different approaches, some are farther than others, um, and we're in conversations, I think we supply to pretty much every auto manufacturer. And you'll be a big part of the battery side of that in, in America? We have a piece in the battery side, mm -hmm. we have a piece in the body. You know, one of the things that happens is you lightweight vehicles, whether it's to improve fuel and mileage or, um, or improve range in an electric vehicle, is that you want to lightweight the vehicle. And so you start shifting materials, and we're a materials company. So you shift from heavy materials like steel more and more to aluminum or polymer composite materials. And what happens is with steel you use metal welds, but when you move to aluminum or composite plastics, you start to have different interfacial um, uh, challenges, and so what happens is you start to use adhesives instead, or tapes. And so we're very involved. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so things that... Stick it to keep the car together. You know, okay. and I'm telling you, you know, it came from sandpaper, but one evolution after another. Um, you know, it really... And, and, and ultimately, that's a really important piece of how we adapt it. Um, but also in the climate space, we're, we're innovating in ways you might not expect. Um, we've been providing roofing granules to help prevent, uh, you know, leakage into your home and <laughs> protect your roof from... Um, rain or hail for, for decades, but did you know that that same technology that we use to coat the roofing granules to make them the color that you want to coordinate with your house or your neighbors, we've now incorporated in there um, UV reflection, oh. reflectings to help reduce the urban heat island effect. And also more recently, we have incorporated the ability to in interact with smog in the air. So particularly in places like Southern California, where there's a lot of air pollution in the air, that the, you can buy roofing granules or buy your roofing shingles that look just like the ones you would have purchased anyway. And they are actually engaging with the, the pollutants in the air to essentially the equivalent of one home is the equivalent of two trees. Ooh, sorbents. That are, sorbents yeah. to pull 
it's long out of the air. So great. it's part of just continuing to reinvent, good. recognize where we are today, what technologies we have to bear, how to be smarter about things, and um, it's a continual reinvention. That and that's what makes it exciting. Yeah, yeah. Some Twitter questions, you're kind of covering them as they come in. Oh, that's great. But, um, uh, one is just to, to be how holistic really are you in your company? So people are just concerned about renewable energy sources, for example, or your supply chains. Like, so it's good to have these sparks of innovation mm -hmm. in the product. But in terms of just how comprehensive is the sustainable development planning in your, in, in your, in your company? Yeah. Um, and the one was concerned about plastic. Mm -hmm. um, and it's great uh, that you mentioned that actually plastic is probably, if you know the chemistry, is probably the most recyclable thing ever. But you have one product, but how about your whole range of products? Is there still this plastic issue yeah. that you could try and... and yeah, and, and, and yeah. So great questions. And I'm yeah. really glad you brought up renewable energy because we, we've been a long time player, just like we've been in the car industry from the beginning or the electronics industry from the beginning. We've been in the renewable energy components piece for the beginning and you know, ranging from things to help make them more reflective and last longer, absorb, um, absorb a higher percentage, get a higher yield essentially from your solar panels, helping wind turbines last longer because of some um, materials that are at the cutting edge of that and more durable. But this year we announced, um, and, and one of the goals that I mentioned from 2015 was to go to 25% renewable electricity in our global operations by 2025. Mm -hmm. It felt like a really big goal when we set it in 2015. Last year we surpassed it. So this year, we have announced that instead of going to 25% by 2025, we're going to go to 50% of our global operations by 2025. But wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. Okay. We, we flipped the switch um, second quarter so that our, our headquarters, which is one of our larger um, use, using facilities of electricity, went to 100% right that day in partnership with our local utility, Excel Energy. What's the source? It is wind from the state of Minnesota. All right. So Good. right there. Minnesota wind. Minnesota wind. Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> and then we made a commitment with the RE100 that we will convert our entire global operations to 100% renewable electricity. So we're really serious about that, both from the supply side, helping make it happen, and from the use side of helping make sure we're walking the talk and we're advancing that and we're helping others do the same. And I think that's the, one of the most important things around sustainability today is it is a partnership. We talked about with regulators and civil society, but it's partnerships far broader than that. It's with our customers, it's with our suppliers, and, and that's what we're working on. So that brings me to the plastics piece because plastics is, I do think, one of the great challenges of our time. Um, we can debate about whether it's, you know, our meat footprint or the climate overall or plastics. There are plenty of challenges and crises, if you will, to go around. But plastics is one that I take really seriously. And, um, you know, I gave you two examples with, you know, our Scotch-Brite, with Thinsulate. But there's a lot more, and we have to do those in partnership with others. One of the challenges with all of the plastic recycling that is conventionally done today is that each time you do a recycling step, you actually degrade the product. And so, you know, there were great examples earlier today in Indonesia with the plastics in the roads, and we do things like that, power benches, and those are good uses, but the really higher place, I believe, to go, and it requires a lot of science, is to really reinvent to the same quality of plastics. And so we work with suppliers on how we do that. We don't make plastics, but we do use them, and we use them to help people, like I mentioned, the, the worker safety, a number of healthcare spaces, some of our packaging, other things. But what we're working on with our partners is chemical recycling. And chemical recycling actually allows you to take the plastics, reprocess it to the same level that it had before. And what that means is um, that that then creates the way for a truly circular economy. And I love that working with some of these um, suppliers that we have, um, they do cross the chemical and, and, and um, petrochemical spaces. And, and some of them have made the comment of, you know, if we were going to start today and reinvent our, our plastic supply chain, we would not be pumping down miles into the into the ground, into the ocean, into, or fracking our way to produce the materials. We would not be pulling this dirty, gunky oil out 
to create plastics. We would be pulling it from oceans. We would be mining it from landfills. Mm -hmm. We would be doing so many things that it's so much closer to the end product. Yeah, yeah. So I personally, like, okay, so many of you in the room w might not remember, but I remember the days when aluminum cans would sit down, you know, on the side of roads, and you would see aluminum as, as a common waste material. Today that doesn't happen because we have a very smart, relatively efficient recycling process for aluminum. I believe that in the course of our lifetimes, and I would say all of our lifetimes, we will close that supply chain for, for plastics. It does require us all to step in and have our role on it. We don't make plastics, but we're a purchaser, we partner with our suppliers to help close that loop, and we need consumers you know that pull that. And we need, know the science, we know it's possible. Yeah. It, it requires things to be done differently, but that's what it's all about. Gail, thank you so much. Very, very exciting, very encouraging. Thank you for being here. Fantastic. Wow. I think we heard a lot of uh, great solutions, and uh, it's ex really wonderful to hear. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll okay. lead off.